This is Control Structure, episode 114, for September 7th, 2016. Big week to everyone listening. This show has notes. Visit thenexus.tv slash cs114 to see them. I'm your host, Stephen Orvis, and with me is the other host, Andrew Bailey. Hi, Andrew. Yay! Yay! So, um, it looks like we completely skipped uh, last time because, well, I guess I wanted to make it into a cooking show, but uh, it seemed like uh, Chris kind of dominated every conversation. Which is basically what the last cooking show was, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, just get Chris in a in like a group of people, and he talks the most. It's uh, Chrisist. Yes, and then uh, like remember when he was like talking about like the horror of Babylon, and like I forget what he what exactly he asked everyone, and then I'm like, Babylon is conformist. <laughs> They're all posers. Have you ever noticed he loves talking about whores? <laughs> Elsa and Babylon. <laughs> Anyways, that's Chris for you. Yes, uh, he is a very uh, interesting character. Yes. Uh, although, uh, it's not exactly healthy to be around him that much. I mean, he, he allegedly says that his family gives him all this poison, so he needs to get away from that. But apparently it rubs off on him... Uh, while he's with his parents, and it rubs off on everyone else when he's around everyone so he else. Brings, brings the poison with him. It's like after you've been with radioactive stuff, you walk away, and it's just, you're radiating from it, and your your eyes are glowing, <laughs> and your fingernails are like growing long and like curved and all that, and your hair is green and all that, whatever. <laughs> or falling out. Or falling out. <laughs> That's currently back in the day. You could buy these kits that would radiate your water with radiation so you could drink radioactive water because there's all these health benefits to it. <laughs> Obviously not. That, that, but that's what they thought. That that sounds like something they would put into uh, Fallout, one of the games. That was into the style of that game, if I know what you're talking about. Yes. So, um, hey, you realize that Pittsburgh has been in a few games. In a few games? Yes. Uh, including a Fallout. Really? Yeah. Um, so it turns out, at least in reality, that, uh, you ever heard about Uber? I have heard about Uber. They would be the company we discussed a while back who apparently stole, like, well, bought half of, uh, Carnegie Mellon's, uh, developers from them. Or, like, robotics people or yes, something? Yes, robotics specialists yeah. type of people. The, the company that, uh, you know, has a car sharing service or ride sharing service so um it turns out that they are developing self-driving cars which is why they have a need for all these robotics people and it turns out that those people didn't exactly move too far because uh because uber is trying to test their self-driving cars in uh downtown pittsburgh so, uh, for the moment, they actually have someone in there, you know, to take over, uh, for a very important reason that I will get to in a moment. Uh, so, uh, like, they're, you know, sort of, like, monitoring, uh, like, how these cars get around and stuff, because, uh, like, I've actually, I've actually seen one of these cars driving around when I was, uh, biking around on the North Shore about, like, a month ago. You know, it was just, like, a you know, sort of like a black SUV uh, with Uber on the side and, like, all these cameras and stuff on top. It was, like, really weird. Like, I looked at it and I was like, oh, that's, like, one of their cars or something. It sort of looked, I guess it would sort of look like a Google Maps car or, like, a street view yes. car. But, uh, like, these are self-driving cars and those are, like, you know, the robotic eyes, I guess you could say, on top. So there's a QA job that would be slightly more dangerous than your normal QA job. <laughs> yes, slightly. Uh, but it you wouldn't be stuck in a cubicle all day. It's true. You would not be stuck in a cubicle all day. You'd be stuck in a car all day. <laughs> That's trying to kill you, maybe. <laughs> so, uh, like, those cameras are there to see, uh, like, street signs and fire hydrants and buildings and street lights and, like, all these other things that are on the road. Uh, like, 
also manholes and potholes and like uh, lane marks on the road uh, and uh, like other things like that. So the thing is, when you drive over a bridge, you don't have too many of those. You just have a railing that looks like the previous section of a railing. Yeah. And the concrete that looks like the previous section of concrete. So it knows that it's on a bridge, but it doesn't know exactly where on the bridge it is. And that's apparently a problem. Because even though it has GPS, that resolution is only within like 10 feet or so. I say you're on a bridge. You know you're on a bridge. Just keep driving. <laughs> what could possibly happen? <laughs> it's only a bridge. Well, more on that in a moment. So, uh, like, this is a problem since, like, it doesn't exactly know where on the bridge it is. And Pittsburgh is filled with bridges. There's, like, 500 of them. More bridges than any other city in the world, allegedly. So, uh, so you're driving along on the bridge. And, you know, they're, they're sort of, like, doing some construction on the bridge. And suddenly the bridge is on fire, which actually happened in downtown Pittsburgh uh, on, yeah, it was last Friday afternoon. So, uh, yeah, it's been closed for a while. And, uh, hey, 446 bridges Pittsburgh has, according to a 2006 uh, study. And uh, so, yeah. And apparently, according to Quora and uh, Wikipedia. Yeah, Wikipedia, good source there, right? Yeah. yeah. It's more accurate than Encyclopedia Britannica, according to Wikipedia. See? I <laughs> told you it was good. <laughs> yeah! So, um, yeah. Uh, getting in and out of downtown Pittsburgh is maybe a little bit more difficult than what it was. Uh, but, uh, yeah. On Friday, I went downtown, but I took the T instead, which goes over a different bridge. So, uh, you know... I was riding around 18 miles on Friday, 18 miles Saturday, and 18 miles Monday. That's a whole lot of riding. Uh, so did you ride in the same place or different places? Uh, same places. Okay. I wondered since 18 was kind of convenient to hit three times. Yeah. Um, I would ride around on the North Shore, but like that, I think even if I do like a full tour of the North Shore, it's maybe 12 miles so I can get a little bit more on the uh, south end. I see. Uh, actually, I can get, like, really a lot more because that one goes all the way to D.C. You can get really a lot more, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> Raspberry? 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 Raspberry, there's still no one next door! <laughs> so, apparently now you can make raspberry cake in the Raspberry Pie Bakery. Uh, this uh, 12-year-old uh, coder apparently decided that he wanted a way to configure a raspberry pie uh, easily uh, and headlessly so that... Uh, it can do such handy things as connecting to certain networks and things. And of course you can go in and edit some file under etc slash network slash something slash something and achieve those things. That's uh, fun. Some Googling and uh, some uh, handy use of VI. It's not that difficult if you have Google. Anyways, uh, this is way easier because uh, you has like a drag and drop style it almost looks too easy maybe but yeah. it does look easy uh you have drag and drop you can like when it boots or on first boot on every boot uh and then uh you can go ahead and tell it well i want to uh change my password or i want to set up this wi-fi network and here's the ssid and here's a password and the type and i want you to go ahead and install this software like vnc server or something and download this and uh, execute this script or something like that uh, and so that's pretty neat. So you can set up a, a brand new Raspberry Pi headless mode. And also it says, too, if you have one that's already up and, and, and going, you can uh, pop your SD card into your computer and go ahead and run this bakery thing on it. And you can modify your existing uh, Pi uh, and use this to add on functionality onto it, such as your, your configuration or whatnot. So it's a neat concept for quickly uh, configuring 
uh, your pie so that you can uh, make it easy to do. I guess it could be a full imaging too, really, if you needed to. Yeah. So that that makes it uh, foolproof uh, configuration. So this is great for I see especially the younger kids that want to do stuff because, like I said, VI googling you can do it, but if you've never done it before, it's gonna be harder. After you do it four or five times, it's starting to start click as you start googling some. But for people that haven't played with it before, I see this as being really great. This is getting back to with the the Pi Foundation. They want uh, the kids and coding and stuff to yeah. happen. So it's good. It's neat that there's some young kid too that figured it out. And apparently now Microsoft is uh, also selling a kit for Raspberry Pis so that you can make IoT things. Uh, I guess there's a, a couple sensors. It said actuators and uh, some cables and some connectors it didn't really look that super fancy and touchscreen and an lcd out monitor uh, i guess the touchscreen is probably 40 or 50 bucks worth yeah so and then the lcd things probably maybe 10 15 so i suppose it gets close to the 150 dollars that it costs but i don't know but i suppose uh people might make kits or books for it microsoft uh, must be hoping five. Five inch HDMI display with USB touchscreen. Yeah. So this does not use that little dedicated port. That's USB. Okay, yeah. interesting. Cool. So um, apparently GE bought out something. Yes, they did. They spent 1.4 Instagrams uh, to buy two companies. Uh, and. Uh, Arkham AB from Sweden and SLM Solutions Group uh, in Germany. Yes, they both seem focused on 3D printing type of technologies. Uh, the one uh, deals with uh, these lasers that for melting and building the metal and something with the powdered metals, which both are uh, useful things probably for 3D printing. Actually, uh, this past it was Sunday, I 3D printed this uh, bearing that comes printed. It's out, mine was out of plastic, obviously, but it's a bearing that was printed. And they mentioned the article at GE and their uh, airplane engines and such. And so I was realizing there's things I can print that would be impossible to assemble. And my bearing is an example of something because the grooves on the bearing go two directions. And so that would be impossible to slide in place unless you had a ring that like snapped apart and put together. It's impossible to disassemble that bearing without breaking it, nor to assemble it either. And so you can do things with 3D printing that normal manufacturing, ma manufacturing it's impossible to do. So, interesting. So, uh, hey, we mentioned Microsoft back there. We did mention Microsoft, that they were doing the hardware thing. Yeah. And uh, um, So they, do you know they also do lots of software? They do software? Yeah. Uh, apparently that's what the soft of Microsoft means. I, I thought they did like you know like phones and things like that. Yeah, they do Xboxes. And Xboxes. So um, apparently they have this thing called PowerShell, and uh, they're apparently on this open source spree. So they uh, have open sourced PowerShell. Yes. Um, ironically, this is the first thing they open sourced that I'm actually not that thrilled about because I'm actually not that much of a PowerShell fan. So anyways, <laughs> but yeah, I guess that uh, it's going to be useful to someone. And honestly, I'm not that much of a fan of PowerShell either, even though I wrote the script to download the entire the Nexus.tv podcast archive, uh, both in uh, PowerShell and Bash. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's it's a thing. And maybe you might be able to run it on your Raspberry Pi. I bet you could, since apparently you can put Raspberry Pi and Windows together already. But yes, you probably could. Uh, even on the uh, Raspbian. Raspbian, yes. Yeah. Um, so along with your uh, Raspberry Pi, uh, you might want to put uh, uh, Open SSH on there. Uh, you know, instead of like doing a VNC type thing. So uh, whenever you're setting up OpenSSH uh, anywhere, uh, you might want to secure it a little bit. And uh, Mozilla has this helpful guide of uh, how they configure their uh, SSH daemons on all of their servers. And they, uh, they seem to be uh, pretty 
uh, up there. Uh, they have configurations both for the server and the client. Uh, so, like, this restricts, like, the ciphers and the, uh, was it, the hash functions used. And, uh, you know, even, even with this, uh, like, whenever I have, you know, I'm using, like, the most, uh, was it the modern uh, uh, script here. And, uh, like, whenever, you know, like, script kitties out on the internet sort of scanning yeah. around everywhere, it seems that most of them will fail because they do not support the modern uh, profile. Like, the accepted cipher suites or something is, like, not what they use, oh, I guess. Interesting. Um, so, uh, like, I was doing this, and, uh, let's see, I was... I somehow wanted to log in to my router from my server. Uh-huh. So, like, I had also updated it with the uh, the client configuration as well, which also restricts the ciphers and everything. Okay. So I had to create a file that sort of overrode it just for this one host, you know, being the router itself. Okay. So, because, like, routers have run lower-powered hardware. So it doesn't have this good of encryption. Yeah. I see. So um, it also goes over, you know, use uh, public key uh, identification whenever you log in. Is that opposed to passwords? It's saying. Yeah. Um, oh, it's just faster. Yeah. So. Hang on. Does it give a reason why? Is it because of plain text and not sending your password out there? Um, well, because a password is only a certain number of bits of, uh, was it entropy, mm. whereas a public key, uh, especially like RSA public keys are like thousands Quite of bits. Bit. That's true. That's a great point. Yeah. So, and also, uh, I think it was like, uh, Edwards curve or like twisted Edwards curves and elliptic curves mm -hmm. are also very secure as well. Um, and, uh, so you remember like the NSA going in and sort of like compromising standards. Yeah. There's like, I think it's like one of these twisted Edwards curves is completely, uh, was completely independently developed outside of the government. So it is sort of proven to not have any government installed backdoors of any kind. Which can be a good thing in this day and age. Yes. Um, so unfortunately it doesn't look like uh, Mozilla recommends fail to ban here, which is a program that monitors uh, some of your... Uh, logs for uh, like I think it does SSH and also does Apache and mm -hmm. maybe a few others to uh, block uh, any IPs that look suspicious. So like they keep trying you with the wrong password. Yeah, that's a that's a nice idea there. So like I have that plus my public key crypto, and now like I don't really feel bad about running on port twenty two anymore. So, um, let's just say this. Bouncing to compl something completely different, uh, like CSS over your, uh, your web server there. Uh, so, uh, what if you want to uh, figure out if a certain browser supports a CSS feature? Well, there's actually a CSS thing for that, uh, and it's called at supports, and you can query, uh, you know, a certain... Uh, I think it's just like this uh, CSS property or value. So you can say, it's like, oh, if you support this feature, uh, use it over here like this. And, oh, since you support this, you might not want to do these other things either. So I wonder what the counterpositive is. Is there like an else for the support? Or can you say not supports? So if that's the case... Then you write your CSS above it, assuming that oh, it does not. Oh, right, and it overwrite it, because yeah. the last one wins. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. So, yeah, this can be used in a, uh interesting way. Uh, but even, even then, like, I haven't exactly thought of a way that I personally would use this, say, on my blog, because, uh, like, see if a CSS uh, property is not recognized, it is ignored. So, like... So it's this not going to break everything. Right. It just so, doesn't see something, yeah. Yeah, so, like, this is in the case where if you support this, 
also do this other thing mm-hmm. too. So apparently, uh, Linux has some uh, birthdays. Yes, uh, August twenty fifth was the anniversary of the original posting that Linus did about Linux uh, publicly and asking for general feedback and uh, comments from people, uh, things they'd like to see in an operating system. Uh, so uh, there's a very nice interview here of uh, Linus and uh, going through the early versions of Linux and uh, kind of some monumental steps that he saw being taken and such like that. It's kind of kind of good to read. So, uh, you know, this, that's when he... Uh, put on like some kind of Usenet group. Hey, I'm making a uh, operating system kernel for 386 compatibles, and it's not going to be big and professional like GNU or anything. Apparently, it uh, is now though. But it's kind of eaten the world anyway. It has. That's... So, uh, hey, it's starting to eat uh, gaming a little bit. I can has a Linux games. Yes, uh, lots. And because I'm uh, running no script, uh, all of these are in just one long It's actually kind of really nice because it was really annoying clicking next a hundred times. <laughs> so this page has, you know, like all like 25 pretty good Linux games. And if you cross reference that with the uh, also recently released PC Gamer Top 100 list, like I'd say at least half if not three quarters or more of these games are on both lists. So that's pretty significant because that's telling you that uh, not having games really isn't so much of an excuse for not using Linux anymore. Oh, Kerbal, that was one I had uh, mentioned during the fringe there. That one kind of surprised me. I hadn't known that one was on Linux, but that's a, I that's think, a pretty popular game. Yeah, I think that's uh, built on Unity, actually. Okay. So... It's not exactly surprising that it's on uh, Linux. So, and Civ Five and Borderlands, and uh, I think Bioshock Infinite as well. So, like, apparently 2K games are actually coming to Linux quite often. Um, I think they also do the XCOM as well. It seems like Steam is still running with the Steam OS idea, and they're it's been kind of quiet lately. It seems like they're just seeing they're churning out games, setting themselves up for it to kind of get big. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I need to get on that a little bit. Uh, have I been owned or pwned or whatever? This is this is kind of ambiguous here, but I guess, you know, pwned. It, what, from what I Googled it once, from what I understood, pwned was just a misspelling of owned. Yeah. That's, that's what I uh, understood it to be. So... Uh, I think we've uh, mentioned this website before, but it's a site where uh, that collects all these data breaches mm-hmm. and uh, like puts like all these emails and usernames into lists and lets you search uh, through them to see if your password or password hash has been leaked uh, or stolen. Uh, so like it does, I don't think that. Uh, uh, okay, well, there, there's there been a few uh, breaches of late, uh, at least notable. Uh, Dropbox and Last.fm uh, got breached back in 2012, but they both turned out to be a little worse than first thought. Those the uh, ones where anyone could log into any accounts? Uh, at one point, you could do that on Dropbox. Uh, but uh, so... Uh, let's see, I don't think that they have the last FM up on here, uh, but I guess presumably it might be uh, pretty soon. Uh, but this site has like dozens and like maybe like 50 or so uh, like services that have been uh, compromised that you can uh, search for. So um, let's see, I've been talking about this for a while. And uh, I finally got around to, you know, reformatting my server and installing uh, re-in- or reinstalling Ubuntu on it. The uh, latest one, that is. Uh, actually, the Zubuntu with the X-Face uh, stuff on it. Um, so I, uh, you know, reinstalled it and I encrypted the main drive on it. And uh, so that 
made me uh, like have to enter in a password whenever it would boot. So when, uh, you know, how should I say this? Whenever, like, say, the power would go out or something or I needed to, like, reboot because, like, I don't know, a new kernel came out or something. Uh, so, like, I would have to actually be here so I could go down to the basement and enter the password. Yes. So that means that you need to have some sort of way to get in there in the bootloader if you want to remote in. So there's this little thing called Drop Bear, which is a SSH server that's like meant for embedded things. So you can embed this SSH server into the bootloader and, uh, you know, log in, uh, give it the password to unlock the disk, and then it will finish booting. Uh, so the thing about doing it on Ubuntu is that Plymouth, uh, which is the... Uh, how should I say, the little graphical thing that allows you to log in, like, visually. You know, like, that little prompt that comes mm -hmm. up with, like, username and password box. Yep. Uh, that uh, comes in and says, hey, uh, your your hard drive's encrypted. I need the key for that, please. Uh, and then it shows, like, a password box, you know, on the monitor. But if you're doing uh, doing it remotely through SSH... Plymouth will not exit. So is is your server not headless then? Or? It is not. Okay. So uh, if you remember, uh, you know, walking down there, like there's you know the the actual box, and then there's a microwave with the CRT on top of okay. it. Okay, I think I do remember that. Yeah, uh, we can go down there and look at it again if you want. But uh, so it's not exactly headless, but it operates like it is. Yeah. Uh, so. The thing of it is, is that Plymouth will not, you know, kind of exit whenever the drive is unlocked. So you need to work around that. Uh, a workaround like, don't run Plymouth quite yet. Which puts in a rub to the whole thing in that you need to unlock it remotely. You cannot unlock it, you know, like when you're s sitting right in front of it. Which um, uh, is at least usable that way. Yes. So, uh, you know, you uh, download that, uh, configure it with uh, some public keys, uh, you know, like the host key and then your user key. Uh, so you can, you know, log in and, you know, still not use passwords uh, and just use the public, the sec more secure public keys and uh, unlock it. Uh, and then, you know, it'll finish booting and everything. So... Uh, then I'm like, okay, this seems to be working pretty well. So I, over the next few days, uh, I uh, reformatted and encrypted the other drives as well. So, and then like put everything, you know, back on there. Uh, did did a restore from the external drives that I have. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So you got to actually test your backup then. Yes. Very good. And then uh, not only that, I actually... Uh, Let's see. Yeah, because I put it all back on there, which, you know, had the added benefit of, it's like, oh, you're writing all this data, so it's, like, kind of defragmented now, uh, since it's, like, being written out all at once. Uh, I, I wanted to say that I also, you know, deleted everything off the external and added it back onto the external, but I don't think I did that. So, yeah. Uh, things are getting uh, encrypted. Very nice. So uh, if you would like to send us feedback, uh, we can actually answer it on the podcast. You can go ahead and do so at thenexus.tv and click the contact link. Or if you're already looking at the show notes, you can do so right below our pretty faces, uh, mine being on the moon. So uh, anything you're looking forward to? Uh I'm looking forward to doing some more blacksmithing this weekend. I haven't done that for quite some time. So. Yeah. Uh, uh, my, so my weekend. So you had a tong. I had a tong. And then you had another tong. I had another tong. Did you put them together? Uh, as I recall, where I left that most recent uh, two tongs, uh, they uh, I tried pinning them, and I think the pin didn't work. And uh, then I decided to take that their online class, and ever since then I hadn't had any time. So it's uh. now that I've found that online class, and it's over. 
I have now time to go back to blacksmithing. So and 3D printing. <laughs> so I'm looking forward to uh, being on a podcast with the uh, other guys. Um, so we're sort of doing a, a series on transportation. Uh, we've already done. They've already done biking. And I think we've done public transportation, and now I think we're going to be doing driving tomorrow night. There you go. Um, which I think is particularly relevant for me, since I've been driving longer than any of the others on the network. There you go, so you can be the driving expert. I can be the old man and, you know, <laughs> get off my lawn! <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, let's see, I'm looking forward to... Uh, this week, because uh, yesterday was Labor Day, so this means this is a four-day week, work week. Uh, it goes uh, that much faster. That is nice, because it just goes by faster. Yes, and then uh, I think it's on the 18th, which is a Sunday, my, uh, uh, see, my company and the other one that's sort of attached to the hip are having a company picnic. Ah, very nice. So, uh... It looks like uh, Chris and or Zach may be able to join. So, um, yeah. And uh, so, yeah, last time you came down was uh, pretty nice. We had uh, lots of uh, meat and casserole. We did. We might have had too much. <laughs> so, uh, did, I, for, I forget, did you take it? Oh, yeah, you took your sausage home. I did take the sausage home, and they ended up being made into some sort of a... A big bean, something or another, at some point in time. <laughs> cool. So um, it wasn't big bean, something with beans. I forget. So, um, well, I guess that's it. So, um, have a good one. You too.